So, uh, hi. Thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Um, my name is Mark Dunning. I'm the chairman of the, uh, coali of the Usher Syndrome Coalition. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to accelerating research into the most common cause of combined deafness and blindness. Um, we uh, bring together a community of uh, researchers, prominent researchers from around the world, and families in an urgent movement to find a cure. We are very honored here today to have uh, Congressman David Young from Iowa. And, uh, oh, Congressman, if you'd like to come up and say a few words. Good afternoon. How you doing? Good. Good. Let's liven the place up a little bit, shall we? <laughs> Congress doesn't have to be so dull, you know. Um, good afternoon to you and all those who are uh, used to being on the Hill and work on the Hill and those who are from out of town and have just come in and are, and are visiting us. Uh, we're going to get an important briefing today on the state of Usher Syndrome research. But before we get started, I want to thank the Usher Syndrome Coalition for organizing this event today and the Stephen A. Wynn Institute for Vision Research at the University of Iowa, my home state, for sponsoring this event. I was just telling uh, our featured speaker here that these issues affect, um, they affect everybody. I mean, sometimes it's your family, um, your friends, relatives, new friends that you'll be meeting. But, you know, my father has um, had glaucoma for a long time and is starting to lose his hearing. I don't know if that's just because of age or what, but, you know, he's had 12 surgeries in his eyes up at Mayo Clinic. Um, I mean, his eyes look like, you know, rag dolls, you know, sometimes they're just really kind of scarred, but we keep looking and we keep fighting and we keep trying to find uh, what we need to make sure that we can alleviate a lot of this with those that we love. So your presence in this room is encouraging. For those unfamiliar with the disease, Usher syndrome is the most common cause of combined deafness and blindness in the world. Nearly 50,000 50, Americans have lost their hearing and are losing their vision to this devastating disorder. Those with Usher syndrome and their families demonstrate courage every single day, and you know this, and they face so many challenges. It's not just hearing and vision loss, there can be balance issues as well as an overwhelming social burden. Consider this, our country spends an estimated $140 billion annually in direct and indirect costs for people with vision loss and eye disorders. That sum does not even include the hearing loss aspect. So consider this, 82%. The deaf-blind community as a whole has an 82% unemployment rate. People with Usher syndrome have a suicide rate that is two and a half times greater than the general population. These stats are disheartening, but we got to use these as a challenge to do better. We're here today because the Usher Syndrome Coalition has done just that and given everyone reason to be optimistic. And due to the efforts of the Usher Syndrome Coalition, this rare disease has been added as a new category in the NIH Categorical Spending List for Research, Conditions, and Disease Categories. That's a big step, folks. This gives Usher greater visibility and total dollars spent, including specific grants that need funded. And a lot more needs to be done. Great investment in Usher syndrome research is still a major hurdle, but it's a great start. And we know that there's no cure right now for Usher syndrome, but we need to make sure that that changes. And I'm very proud now of the research that's been done at the University of Iowa, Iowa Hawkeyes, under the direction of our featured speaker, Dr. Ed Stone, at the Stephen A. Wynn Institute for Vision Research. They're making breakthroughs every day, and I thank you, and I look forward to hearing what you're going to say here and share with us. They're on the cutting edge, and like you, I'm fascinated to learn more. I hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. Stone. Thank you. So we're going to increase the anticipation for meeting Dr. Stone, uh, because earlier I mentioned the uh, urgency of uh, our need to find treatments. And so to kind of demonstrate that urgency, I'm going to invite uh, my daughter, Bella Dunning, to come up here and say a few words. So come on up, Bella. Okay, so I'm Bella Dunning, and I'm a sophomore in high school, and I have Usher syndrome. I was born profoundly deaf, and I got my first implant in 20 months. 
and now I have two, and I can hear fine, and I, my speech is good, and I can, I'm great. My vision, however, is slowly getting narrower and narrower, and I can't see this podium as I talk to you right now. And my balance, you probably saw me wobble up here, not great, I can't balance on my foot for more than 20 seconds. But that doesn't mean I'm not capable. I'm a straight aid student in a public school, high school, and I love animals, and I ride, horse, I ride horses, as you can see in the picture here. That's my horse, Apollo. And then if my equestrian team does well, next, next week in each zones, we'll be able to go to nationals in Wellington, Florida. Though I plan to go to college, I wanted to be a vet, but I don't think my vision's gonna be good enough, but I will be okay because Dr. Stone is working very hard on treatment, but he just needs more resources. It would be great if you could help. Thank you. Thanks, Belle. Um, so uh, I'd also like to uh, so sort of uh, one end of the spectrum with uh, Bella, who is uh, young and uh, is still has usable vision. Sorry, Moira, I didn't mean young. Uh, so is uh, is uh, still has usable vision. Um, but uh, I'd also like to invite up our vice chair, who's not old at all, uh, to. Um, yeah, yes, Bella's just younger. Um, who, yeah, I know. I'm trying to back out of it. Give me a second. Uh, so I'd like to invite up our vice chair, Moira Shea, to give you an idea of what it's like to have lived through the different stages of the disease and to be old. I'm not using it. Okay. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. And as usual, Mark forgot to introduce my guide dog, and his name is Finnegan. But he's more than a guide dog, he's my American Express card, because I can't leave home without him, and he's accepted everywhere. So, um, speaking of being accepted everywhere, just almost 20 years ago, I was working up here in the Senate, and uh, I couldn't get my dog onto the Senate floor, and it sort of made national and international news in terms of standing up for my civil rights. So, you know, when you have the combination of deaf blindness, you also are faced oftentimes with discrimination. Um, I just wanted to give a little, um, put a face to what one goes through, and basically, you know, it's, it's, the science is great, but the impact, the toll on individuals is enormous. Um, as someone mentioned it's 82% unemployment, and I am so lucky that I was able to work and to retire, and um, for some reason, I find myself very resilient. But so many individuals, including myself, are you know, faced with anxiety, stress, depression, and um, social isolation. Um, and, and we, we need to move forward on that. Um, Bella may not, Bella did not have the same experience. I don't think she had the same experience as my parents did. When you learn that you have ushered, you're told to go to school and learn Braille. Um, today, we don't say that anymore. We say there's hope and there's a, a, an excellent chance for a treatment. And the only thing that's holding us all back, like everything else, is money. Um, so I hope you will support us in appropriations, and I hope you will, um, after Dr. Stone's speech, see that we are so close, but we need, we need to move quicker. So um, I had the pleasure of going to Dr. Stone's Institute um, probably about eight, nine months ago, and I was very impressed with his facility. And what I was overwhelmed by was, you know, after 30 years of doing fundraisers, fundraising for retinitis pigmentosa ushers, that when I visited his, his office, I had skin cells taken from my arm, which are being converted into stem cells, and that will develop a new retina. And that is amazing, and I, I am just so thrilled by that. And I've met so many researchers over the years, but um, I've never been more impressed than I am by Dr. Stone. So without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Edwin Stone. Well, 
<coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Moira, and thanks to all of you for coming today. And uh, it's a terrific pleasure for me to be here and speak on behalf of the uh, patients and their families who are faced with uh, Usher syndrome. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it today, but uh, the majority of uh, the talk, I really want to give you a glimpse into what we think uh, the path out of the woods is, what, what the path to the cure is. And uh, I'm a professor in the medical school at the University of Iowa, and uh, so I teach medical students. And, and I tell them, you really only need to know one thing about being a doctor, and everything else is, uh, is wind addressing on top of that. And that is you go into the room and you assess the situation in the room and you ask yourself, um, knowing what I know about this thing and about this situation, what would I do? What would I do if this were me? If this were me, if this were my child, who, who would I call? What would I read? What would I do tonight, tomorrow? What would I do and do that? Nothing more than that, nothing less than that. Just do that. And that's, that's what you need to do uh, to be a doctor. So the first few minutes, I want uh, to just do that. And imagine that you've just had your first child, and the child is going to grow into this uh, beautiful young lady that you just met. And you're so excited, and uh, a pilot newborn hearing screening thing has just gotten started in your hospital, see, because it used to be that the deaf kids would get by you for a while. So they got this new pilot thing, and they come and tell you that your child failed this pilot screening program. And you think, yeah, whatever, what, you know, they, they probably didn't have the batteries in it, just so, and whatever, it's a new thing. But finally, you have the definitive second test six weeks later, and you're confronted by the reality that your, da your daughter is profoundly deaf. She doesn't hear at all. And what this means is that if you don't take some sort of action, your child is never going to develop speech. Well, fortunately, uh, these days, there's this technology called cochlear implantation. And it, uh, when Bella was uh, just being diagnosed with her profound deafness, this was far enough along to be essentially a, a routine thing. But routine like what? Well, look at this thing. It's, it's mounted to the side of your head. You know, you drill a hole down through the skull and kind of wind your way through the middle ear and into the cochlea and thread this little thing in there. And if you go home and get to reading about that, you find out how it might not go well and you might have infection and this and that. So anyway, you, you realize you have to do it and you do it and, the, and it goes well and your daughter uh, starts developing normal speech miraculously. You know, these children now speak, you know, basically normally and communicate, interact normally. And so, you, you, okay, now we're back. We got our daughter back. We're good. We're kind of settling in. We got through this thing. And then you're about eight years old and you say, you know, what we ought to do is get this second implant, see? Because there's some evidence that having two of them improves your communication ability and your sense of where you are in the room and all that. So you go in to be evaluated for that. And while you're in there, you just let it, you know, it just slips out that you're having a little trouble navigating in dim light and stuff. And the person who's interacting with you for the second cochlear implant goes, uh-oh, tell me more about that. And so before you know it, you're talking about this. Before you, one minute, you're sitting there and you think you have dealt with this terrible, you know, attack on your daughter and you've survived it and you're now up at age eight and everything is okay. And the next minute, you're in there again talking about another rare thing and you're being told that there are these genes that affect the sensory neurons of the ear and the eye. They're sort of analogous functions in these two organs. And so now, the retina is going to slowly be lost over time. Usher syndrome. So what do you do? You start asking around about it, you know, and so you find out it's this autosomal recessive condition. There are 12 genes that are known. As was already said, it's the most common cause of combined deafness and blindness. That doesn't sound so good when you're reading that. There are 20,000 people in the United States. 
we've touched on this, Bella touched on it. She's already standing up here. She's interacting with you perfectly normally. She's riding her horse. She's competitive. She's great in school. But when she was sitting here looking at her notes, she couldn't see the rest of the podium. Okay, so her field of vision is already constricted and it's constricting more. Moira used to work up here in this building and she used lip reading to augment her reduced hearing. Then she lost the remainder of her central vision and she can't see any of you now, she can't lip read, and so she couldn't do the job that she had done before because she lost that. And she touched on it. When you're faced with that impending loss of vision, you think about that every single hour of every single day of your life. So you read more about Escher syndrome. You read about these things Moira talked about, the communication barriers, educational difficulties, social isolation, all these things are real. We were out there today on the street with the guide dog. Cabs are driving by us. They don't want to fool with the guide dog. Try to get into this building, you have a cochlear implant. You can't go through the machine. So you have to wait for them to go find some woman in an adjacent building, come over and pat your daughter down. On and on and on. You read these things. You go, I don't want these things to affect my daughter. Uh, it was mentioned, most patients with Usher syndrome are on Social Security Disability and on Medicaid, 82% unemployment. So, you know, the bright spot in all this is they met Moira, and here's a woman who graduated from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, worked in this building for senators and congressmen, very accomplished, driven person. And so that's a, that's a bright spot because you go, okay, you know, uh, life is not over. You know, we can, we can conquer this disease. But truth be told, we really, you know, just don't want the guide dog thing. And you know what? Moira doesn't want the guide dog thing either. She wants to get her vision back. So back to this being a doctor thing, what would you want? What would you want? You go in that room and this diagnosis is now you or your daughter. What do you want? You want treatment, above all. You want to protect any vision that you've got and you want to get back whatever you've lost. You want improved diagnosis and prognosis. You know, how fast is this going to change? Uh, can I tell whether one of my other children is going to be affected? Can I tell if other family members are going to be affected? So you want treatment, diagnosis, and prognosis, but above all, you want it right now. And so all through this conversation we're going to have today, you're going to hear this strain of urgency. Urgency. This is not some theoretical thing. This is something that's affecting real people uh, right now. You want it now. So if you, facing all that in yourself or your family, came to Congress, what would you ask for? What would you ask for if you're going to walk in and knock on somebody's door, go look up some folks from your state? I think what you'd ask for is this. You'd say we want increased NIH funding for projects that will lead to safe and effective therapy for this disease. And that's what we spent this morning doing, trooping all around, asking people for that. That's what our ask is. That's what our purpose is of being here. So what do we want this money for? What, what do we want money to do? The goal is actually, uh, you know, sort of distractingly simple. We want to treat everybody, everybody with Usher syndrome. And we want to be able to treat them regardless of the state of their disease. And we want to treat them for fifteen dollars to $50,000 a piece. That's a, that's a stunning number, that number. And the reason I put it up there is if you troop around to corporate entities that are also working on this disease, God love them, I hope they succeed, they're talking about a million dollars a patient. A million dollars a patient. So multiply 20,000 patients times a million dollars and see what number you come up with. Because when we trooped around the halls of power today, we didn't see that number lying around. Okay, so I, I don't know exactly where the solution is going to come in, but it's going to be something less than a million dollars a patient between now and the time we treat everybody with Usher syndrome. So one of the strategies is to appeal to philanthropists 
This guy on the, on the right up here is Steve Wynn. He's standing next to his longtime colleague, Steve Desi. And one of the waypoints on our journey to curing Escher syndrome is having available to us our own GMP facility. So what a GMP facility is, is it's a specialized laboratory that allows you to make gene therapy vectors and stem cell reagents in a fashion that are compatible with the Food and Drug Administration allowing you put, to put them back into a person. They're pretty expensive facilities to create and they're expensive to maintain and it was one of the barriers to us being able to operate in the space of super rare diseases and I'll show you how rare in just a minute. So uh, Mr. Wynn built a GMP facility for us and we now have the uh, opportunity to make our own gene therapy and stem cell reagents at the University of Iowa uh, inexpensively and that's where that fifteen to fifty thousand uh, dollar number comes from. So let's be clear, if a, this, you know, if a corporate entity can have a business model that will make a safe and effective therapy for Escher syndrome and if third party payers will pay for it, that is fabulous, let's go do that. Let's go do that. But if there's one of the other types that doesn't fall within the commercial viability spectrum, then we gotta do that some other way. And I think that other way is gonna be philanthropically assisted academic laboratories uh, at, at universities. So we have this big sign and we actually have a whole series of these in the laboratory. And the big banner across the bottom says, leave no one behind. And that's our way of sort of, you know, taking that idea. Doesn't matter whether you're Moira Shea and you don't have any photoreceptors <laughs> left, or you're Bella Dunning and you can still see fine, <clears throat> everybody in there want some sort of treatment and we want something for all of them. So this, this little slide is to sort of illustrate the notion that we've touched on several times here, that depending on where you are in the course of the disease, different interventions would be applicable to you. So notice down at the bottom, uh, maybe you just failed the newborn hearing screening. You know, you don't have anything wrong with you. Well, there's a thing that says prevention. What does that mean? Well, your family is at 25% risk of having another effective child, the next child that you have, okay? Uh, you go up the ladder and you see things like gene therapy and, and stem cell therapy, and if you don't have any vision, we're talking about Google cars and text-to-speak speech and guide dogs and stuff like that. All of these things are good. All of these things need to be developed and fostered so that we can keep all of these people functioning society uh, as valuable members of our society. So a central thing in all of these treatments is genetic testing. And the reason for that is that there are a bunch of different subtypes of Usher syndrome and frankly there are a bunch of other inherited eye diseases uh, that look sort of like Usher syndrome. And many of the treatments that we want to offer our patients depend upon knowing exactly what the person has because the treatment is very mechanistically uh, driven. So I just want to sort of update you on sort of where the state of play is for uh, genetic testing of Escher syndrome nowadays. Uh, if you got on the web and looked around and called people, you'd find uh, genetic tests for Escher syndrome ranging from about $450 to more than $7,000. If you do everything that you know how to do in 2015, you will find a disease-causing mutation in about 79% of people that have the clinical features of Usher syndrome. Part of that is because there's still some more rare genes to be found, and part of that is deafness is common, and so you can just have deafness and retinitis pigmentosa together accidentally every once in a while, things like that. So that number is never going to become 100%. But I find it stunning that it's almost 80%, because when I started in this business almost 30 years ago, that number was zero. We couldn't molecularly diagnose a single person. But there's this sort of curve of how much it costs to find what. And there's an important number, I think, there that you can find 53%, the genotypes of 53% of Usher patients for $575. So that's just sort of where the state of play is in 2015, and I'll explain that a little more in just a minute. 
So the numbers I'm referring to, these statistics I'll show you in the next couple of slides, comes from the study of a very large cohort of patients, 2,200 patients with Usher syndrome gathered over the last 30 years by all the people that you see uh, up on the slide there. These are all, all our collaborators that have shared samples with us over the last 30 years. And I want to specifically note uh, the first one on the list, Bill Kimberling. Bill Kimberling is known to uh, most people in the Usher world. They know him personally. He's probably been in their living room talking to them about their kid or about their research program. And uh, Bill is a, a faculty member at Boys Town National Research, Research Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska, and we had the great good fortune to have him work in our lab uh, sort of on an extended sabbatical for three or four years where he shared his large collection of DNA samples with us and a lot of uh, these statistics I'm telling you uh, about came from the study of his samples. And we just uh, had a, a donor give us a big gift to create uh, what's going to be known as the William Kimberling Usher Research Laboratory at the University of Iowa to permanently uh, acknowledge and, and sort of memorialize uh, Bill's terrific contributions to the Usher community. And one of the things we're going to be able to do is study the 35 years worth of clinical data that Bill collected to understand the genotype-phenotype relationships of Usher syndrome. And the other thing is we're going to be able to uh, offer genetic tests for patients uh, who can't afford genetic testing otherwise. And there are different strategies for doing this, and just like I said with the corporate thing, let's just get people tested. Let's get everybody tested by whatever means uh, possible. But uh, one possibility, and we did this for another disease, labor congenital amaurosis, a few years ago, where we had philanthropists contribute money to support people who couldn't afford the testing themselves. And that's what we're doing with the Kimberling Laboratory now. So what are the data? I mentioned this. We screened these 1,765 people, and 53% of them were positive for at the $575 rate. And then the other people needed a more sophisticated test for larger genes, more in-depth sequencing. And so on the whole, the testing cost is probably a little bit under $1,500 if you did the whole thing averaged across the whole cohort. This is what the way the genes break down. You see they're very different. USH2A is far and away the most common cause of Escher syndrome. So because this is about a thousand and so findings, you can just look at those numbers and they're sort of like percents. So 60% of the people have S2A, 24.9% of the people have myosin 7A. And at the bottom, S1G, one patient affected with S1G out of more than a thousand people. So I saw a family not long ago who had a disease as rare as S1G and they said, so how, uh, you know, how common is this thing? I said, uh, not very common. She said, well, like, how rare is it? And I said, oh, I think there are probably less than 40 people in the United States with what you've got. So your daughter's seven. There's not another seven-year-old. And so the mom asked me, who's going to work on it then? So what's the answer to that? Who's going to work on it? You are. Yeah, we are. And the way we are in this philanthropically funded nonprofit setting is we're going to reuse parts. We're going to reuse the vectors that we use for one gene for another gene. We're going to make these gene therapies in the basement with philanthropic money. And the costs of these clinical trials are going to be ridiculously low compared to a corporate model. Again, if somebody can make it work on the corporate side, go do that because there are more than 100 genes that cause human uh, photoreceptor disease and we need to treat all of them. So just to show you this business about the tiered testing one last time, let's say you got $57,500 burning a <clears throat> hole in your pocket and you put it in this account. If you use it for the $575 tiered test, you find 53 people's genotypes that way. If you say, no, I don't want to do that, I want the more expensive test, I want to do it, I want to do the more expensive thing in everybody, well, that's fine. But with $57,500, you can only do that in a much smaller number of people. And so the total number you end up finding that way is 23 people. 
So again, if what we want to do is fan out across the country and find everybody, find all 20,000 people and get them tested. If money is no object, let's spend $2,000, get them all tested. If money is an object, let's spend $575 a person and get everybody up to that 53% level. But in my view, you shouldn't spend more than $2,200 uh, for usher testing, regardless of who's paying for it in 2015. So back to our leave no one behind uh, slide. The rest of the talk, I'm going to give you an overview of treatment, the treatment ideas that we have for Usher syndrome in 2015. So what about this prevention thing? So uh, this isn't for every family. This isn't for every family. But a derivative of in vitro fertilization that's been around since the 60s is that after you do the in vitro fertilization and end up with a handful of embryos mm -hmm. in the dish, you can actually test those and see if any of them carry a genotype that's in your family. So this little movie that was shared with me from my friend Mark Hughes in Detroit, and this is a human embryo, living human embryo, held in position with the pipette on the, on the right there, and the other, embryo, the other uh, pipette is coming in to remove one cell from this human embryo, and you'll see it just being vacuumed off in that little pipette. And you can take this one cell off of the embryo and go do a test on it and see whether the family's uh, disease-causing mutations are present there or not. And so we and others have used this dozens of times to allow uh, families to have their own biological children while dodging the uh, disease that's in their family. Again, it's not for every family. Some families would say, no, you know, uh, there's a 75% chance they're not going to be affected, and I hope they're not. Uh, science is coming along, you know, we're hoping they're going to be okay. Some people would adopt children, some people wouldn't have other children. There are lots of different choices that someone can make, but this is one that exists in 2015 if you know your genotype. So then the remainder of the time I'm going to talk to you today is these two things that we talked about, gene therapy and cell therapy. That's really where the the action is uh, these days. And this is sort of an overview schematic of how we're doing it these days. Every patient that comes in gets a blood sample and a skin biopsy. The blood sample we use to go off and genotype the person, try to find their, their gene. Uh, we then establish patient-derived cell lines from their skin. So what do we use these cell lines for? One thing we use them for is we can actually make retinal tissue, actual living retina from, and I'm going to show you that in just a minute, out of a patient's skin cells. So it used to be that if we found a very unusual set of mutations in a patient's sample, something we'd never seen before, we would wonder, does this thing really harm the retina or not? And sometimes you just couldn't be sure. Now we can actually study the living retina of a patient with an unusual mutation and convince ourselves whether it causes disease or not. Another cool thing we can do is I mentioned that we're going to be making these gene therapy things in our own laboratory. Well, how do we know they work? How do we know that they're effective in restoring the protein function to the cell? How do we know they're not harmful to the cell? Well, in the old days, this would be an animal model for every one of those things. And sometimes the animal models don't accurately reproduce the disease. And so an, a whole field will just be stymied for a decade, wringing its hands, because the mouse doesn't recapitulate the human phenotype. But now we actually have the cells from the affected individuals growing in the laboratory, and we can put the, the proposed gene therapy into the actual human cells and show that we restore the existence of the protein, and in some cases, the function. On the other side, for people like Moira, who've lost their photoreceptor cells, we can actually differentiate these cells into retinal precursor cells, just like we're present in the developing human retina, and transplant these into the retina to restore function, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So putting all this stuff together, on one arm of this schematic, you have people like Moira who've lost their photoreceptors, need them back. That's the stem cell transplantation side. And on the other side, we need to make gene therapies for every one of these subtypes of disease as rapidly as possible so that we can arrest the disease with gene therapy. And there'll be some people, some people 
in between who may need both things. They may need some gene therapy to stop the disease they have now, but have already lost enough that when this gets really far along, we want to give them some, some cells back. So here's our gene therapy poster child for the day one more time. And for those of you who haven't seen human gene therapy before, this is my partner, Steve Russell, uh, at the University of Iowa. This is a historical photo on the day of the first gene therapy at the University of Iowa. This was RPE 65. But here you see a 41-gauge cannula injecting a gene therapy construct under the retina of a four-year-old child, just to show you what that looks like. Every fellowship-trained vitreoretinal surgeon in the country could do this type of surgery. So if you had the, the stuff available, um, you know, you could really do this very, very widely once it was going. So the other poster child, Moira, you and Finnegan are back on the screen here. Here's our lady who needs the uh, stem cells back. Let me show you the concept behind this. On the right side there of the, of the screen, you see a normal human retina and a little schematic down below showing that there are three neurons between a photon hitting the retina and the brain. So there are photoreceptors on the bottom. They talk to bipolar cells. They talk to ganglion cells. The ganglion cells talk to the brain. In retinitis pigmentosa, that bottom layer, the photoreceptor cells, are the layers, are the cells that are lost. But the inner two layers, the ones that talk to the brain, they persist for decades, even after someone is completely blind. So the idea is to put new photoreceptor cells back in to talk to those remaining retinal elements. So these are keratinocyte skin cells from a 62-year-old patient of mine. I'm just going to sip a little sip of water here. I think I'm allergic to Finnegan. <coughs> he says, yeah, blame it on the dog. Everybody blames the dog. <coughs> so there uh, you see a 62-year-old uh, patient's keratinocytes. If you treat these skin cells with a series of four cancer genes transiently, the expression of these four genes erases the memory of the skin cells so they now think that they're embryonic cells. And you see how this, these uh, two photographs are taken at the same scale. These are tiny, tiny little embryonic cells now called induced pluripotent stem cells. So you start on this little schema I'm going to show you and change the medium that's in these cells every two days, changing growth factors to mimic what these cells would ordinarily see during the development of the human retina. And when you do that, at about 45 days, you see a clump of dark pigment appearing, and that's the retinal pigment epithelium forming. And the retinal pigment epithelium starts releasing its own factors in the dish, and at 70 days, on one side and only one side of this clump, clear cells start forming. Over time, these cells grow around in a C shape. That's if they're attached to the dish. If they're not attached to the dish, they'll actually form a three-dimensional sphere. I'll show you this thing up close. There's a little C-shaped thing. So what is that thing I'm showing you? What is that? It looks like an eye because it is an eye. It's a little human eye forming in tissue culture because we got stem cells and we put growth factors on it in the right order to make the cells think they were growing in a person. It's retina on the inside, retinal pigment epithelium on the outside, and if you take a little strip of that and stain it with antibodies that recognize things like recoverin and rhodopsin, which are normally present in photoreceptor cells, you see that all the components of photoreceptor cells are in there. And you can dissociate cells like this in this case, we've just put a marker in there that is green whenever the cell thinks it's a photoreceptor cell. And so two weeks after dissociating it from this, this structure, the cells have retained their photoreceptor lineage. So this is a four-day-old mouse. Now the four-day-old mouse is asleep, and he's packed in ice, which is keeping him asleep. And you see a dime in the same field. That's to show you the size that a four-day-old mouse's eye is about the size of Roosevelt on a dime. And that little needle coming in from the side of the, of the field is my partner Arlene Drack with a 41-gauge cannula injecting it reliably into the subretinal space of a four-day-old mouse. 
So she can do that all day long. Then you put a warm uh, glove full of water over the mouse and he wakes back up again. And two weeks later, if you sacrifice the mouse and look, everything that's red in that, in that field is human. So all of those photoreceptor cells in that mouse retina are derived from a 62-year-old person's skin. And so this is the reason that we're really excited about this technology. And we and other people have put iPSC-derived photoreceptors in the mice and actually shown a uh, restoration of the electroretinogram. And some scientists have shown a restoration of actual visual function. So where do we go from here? Now that we can make photoreceptor cells, we've shown that we can put them in via a needle in a so-called bolus injection. Is that all we need to do? Can we just squirt them in to the subretinal space of a human and have them work that way? Well, what we know is that if you, um, the way when I'm talking to patients about this, uh, being that we're in Iowa and we're sort of rural and everything, I say, you know, if you're a chicken farmer, and you've got 10,000 eggs and you want to get them to market, one way you could do it is by getting a snow shovel and just throwing the eggs into the back of your pickup truck with the snow shovel and then driving over 20 miles of uh, bumpy road and you might get to market with an egg or two. And that's kind of what the problem you face if you're going to transplant photoreceptor precursor cells by shooting it at warp factor 9 down a 41 gauge cannula into the subretinal space. The cells really don't like it that much and most of them die. So if you can find a way to support these cells with a biocompatible, uh, biodegradable polymer, there's a 50-fold increase in the survival of the cells. And the cells tend to integrate up into the retina better than if you don't support them with a the polymer. So just to give you a, uh, another reason for this, what I'm showing you here is the very center of a normal uh, retina, and I've got a circle there labeled the macula, and a smaller circle right in the center labeled the fovea. That tiny little foveal area is what you use for your 20-20 vision. If you took a laser and destroyed that little circle, you would have no better than 2200 vision. So it's just that little circle that you need for 2020 vision. And this is a human specimen from my partner, uh, Rob Mullins, showing you what this looks like under a microscope. And you see that little quarter of a millimeter diameter spot that corresponds to that 2020 vision? There's only 9,000 cells in there. 9,000 cells. So we would put millions of cells into the retina when we do a transplant. Okay? So I just remind everybody all the time, you don't have to put 130 million cells back into the retina, which is the number we were born with in order to get useful vision. If we could get 50,000 cells living in the retina, that would be a big deal. So what kind of biopolymer? Well, one of the most abundant polymers on the surface of the earth is what crustaceans and some insects use to make their, make their, little, side, uh, their little exoskeleton. It's called chitin, is the thing the insects have. But if you, if you treat that in such a way to break the chitin down into its monomer, you can, you can add a photopolymerizing agent onto the edge of these monomers. And the purpose of that, just think about the monomers of being like uh, Lego blocks. And now you could build something out of Lego blocks. If you put this photopolymerizable uh, moiety onto the building blocks, then anywhere that a light beam is bright enough the building blocks will stick to each other. And what that allows is the use of a 3D printer to make structures out of this biocompatible, biodegradable polymer. And this is one such uh, device. And the, it's based on what's called two-photon technology, in which you have a couple of lasers going into a clear bath. And wherever the laser beams cross, the light is bright enough that it will exceed threshold and cause the polymer to be polymerized there. And so this next thing is the picture that shows you the kind of structure that you can build with one of these 3D printers. And the, the interspace in between the little bars of this Tinker Toy device are the size of individual human cells. So the idea is to make biocompatible frameworks and then put the human cells into them to support them 
for transplantation. And then over time, that polymer will dissolve and be replaced by the normal extracellular matrix. And just to show you a little bit further uh, evolution of this idea, on the, let's see which side would be, the left side of the slide uh, to you, you would have the photoreceptor precursors and you're gonna make a retina-like uh, layer with the photoreceptors in it. <coughs> and then on the other side, you would make a support layer, the retinal pigment epithelium, and then put these two things together to make a multi-layer living transplant. And again, this would be made from the cells of the patient that you intend to treat so that they would be a perfect immunologic match. And so the patient's immune system would think that these cells belong to them. And this next thing is sort of an artist's rendition. This is just me drawing with uh, Photoshop, you know, not really a real thing. This is real. This is a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. But this is just to sort of give you the idea that if you made these two little semicircular discs of living retinal tissue made from the person, you could sort of roll them up and put them through a small retinotomy in the retina and unroll them under the retina and then basically cover the entire macula with living photoreceptor cells. Or you could make long strips of living tissue and put them in from retinotomies out in the periphery and guide them uh, in toward the center with the retina detached and then uh, do an air fluid exchange to put the retina back on. So the next steps in our mind are to go ahead and put some of these cells into people. Uh, of course, the people we're gonna put them in are completely blind. Why do we wanna put cells into completely blind people? Two reasons, do no harm. We don't wanna endanger any vision uh, from somebody uh, that somebody has now with an unproven technology. But secondly, it'll be easier to tell whether you've got any sort of uh, response if you don't have any light perception at all and then you get restoration of, uh, of light perception. Initially, we'll just put the bolus injections under the retina just like we did in the mice, just to show that the cells are, are safe and tolerated by the body and then proceed with uh, devising the polymer strips that I told you about. So in summary, I've shown you now that, you know, 2015, we can find the genes for almost 80% of people walking in the door. I think we should fan out across the United States and find all these people, reverse that negative message that Moira said. There are a bunch of people out there that were told go home and go blind. Go home, there's nothing we can do. They're out there still. They don't even know they have these diseases. Nobody's talking to them about any of this stuff. We need to go find all of them and genotype them. And uh, then we need to get going with viral mediated gene therapy for the early disease and cell mediated therapy for the late disease. And just not wanting to leave you without putting the ask up one more time for anybody in this room that knows anybody, who knows anybody, who knows anybody, who could help us uh, bust some money loose for this effort, we would really, really appreciate it. So thank you guys for coming.